This episode of AmateurLogic.tv is sponsored by GigaParts.com, the amateur radio online superstore. Through March 16th, use the promo code ALTVGIFT at checkout to receive a free gift when you shop America's largest independent ham radio dealer, gigaparts.com and by mfj the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com and by icom and the ic9100 for more information visit icomamerica.com Welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 50. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And as always, it's great to be back. 50 shows. What do you think, Tommy? Did it seem like we would do that many when we started out? It seems like only seven years. It does, now that I think about it. (laughs) Well, there was that little hiatus after about episode 12. You took a few months off. Yeah, we we had some long summer vacation. A long vacation. Yeah, Yeah, I remember that. But uh, we've been back in uh, full swing here now for um, the last couple of years. So uh, look for one every month now on the 15th. And some months we have more than one. So it just depends on how much content we've got. Peter, what's going on down under? Well, um, I suppose two things. Uh, The first is that uh, I've been working on interfacing a GPS to my Raspberry Pi. And uh, the other thing uh, I should just quickly mention is uh, regarding uh, an appeal by uh, Shannon Morse for contributions to her grandfather's medical fund. Uh, her grandfather is going, undergoing a very, very serious operation. And uh, as you would know, over in the US, uh, the, the health uh, insurance system uh, can be lacking in certain areas. So uh, I just encourage people to contribute a few dollars if they can spare it. Um, we'll put a link up uh, for that. Okay, and Shannon Morris is one of the hosts of Hack 5, a, uh, a video podcast that's on Revision 3. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, great uh, program. Yeah, she's been around they a got, number of years. They got started about the same time we did. Well, they did, actually. I mean, almost to the month, I think. Uh-huh. We, we pretty much started at the same time, so we've, uh, we've known them for a while. I've met Darren before. and uh, Yeah, I've never know. met him. I've chatted with him on email a few times. Yeah. So, nice guy. Yeah, nice guy. Well, I think it just, you know, uh, Shannon's put a lot of time and effort uh, into making uh, some great programs, and it's just nice to be able to do something uh, back for her. Mm-hmm. Tommy, what are you going to be showing us today? Anything in particular? Well, we went to the Ham Fest. We did go to the Ham Fest, and we've got uh, some segments here with some of our friends and some interesting uh, new technology that's been around. Uh, we're going to have uh, email in here with us a little bit later. And Peter, you've got something special this month, don't you? Uh, five watt QRP transmitter using just thirteen components or fourteen components. Uh, it's uh, so great kit. Yeah, it, it was. That's interesting. I'm looking forward to looking at it here in a moment. Tommy, what do you say we go to the ham fest? Let's go, man. I'm always ready for a ham fest. Good ham fest down here in Jackson, Mississippi, this morning. It's a a Saturday morning. It it actually opened on Friday night, and we were here too. I think they're fixing to announce uh, Tommy's radio he's going to win. Yeah, I'll probably get a bunch of handy talkies or something. I only got about five or six of them. I could use a few more. Well, it helps hold you down. Yeah, Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, who have we seen today? Emil has not shown up yet. I heard uh, he got detained. Did you hear about that? No, I didn't hear about that. I did see an email from Don Wilbank said he was getting ready to get ready, so uh, he should be here soon, I think. Well, I think Don did get ready because I saw him a while ago, so he is here. And Emil, um, I had some other guys from New Orleans stop by a moment ago and said that he had to go to a karate class first. Oh, no kidding. It's not that bad up here, man. It's not. 
I mean, you don't need weapons, karate, or anything. No, although they probably did have a gun show in here last week. Well, we found a familiar face here at the Ham Fest. Oh, Jim, what you been up to, man? Oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah we've been I've missing been, you. I've been selling some stuff, man, here at the Ham Fest. I got two tables, and I'm not kidding. I just started bringing it in, and before I could sit it down on the table, I'm not kidding. I had people asking me, hey, man, look, hey, how much you want for that? How much is that? Uh, I'd like to get that right there. And, I, I mean, it was just bam, 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 bam. I brought a ton of stuff. I've already sold half of it. Hey. It's only been an hour and a half. Yeah, I've still got a little ways to go tonight and then all day tomorrow. You ought to be cleaned out. I, I, I mean, really. I, I, I may sell out before 8 o'clock tonight. So. So, so you'll be able to get a whole another load of new stuff to take back, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sell all my junk, buy all somebody else's junk. Hey, here's my buddy, Steve. Steve, come on over here and tell us what you got. Hey, this is this is Steve, KC5JNA. He used to work with George a good while back. NJA, KC5NJA. NJA. I need to get my glasses out of my pocket. <laughs> no, I bought a uh, Yesu uh, FT6ER dual Show band George, radio, yeah. and... Um, it's kind of hard decision, you know. They've got so many choices here, and uh, I was looking at the oceans. I think that's a good one. That's a good. This one's a good one. Yeah. So uh, I'd read online and it looked like I got a you know fair price for it, and uh, so I'm hoping I can figure out how to use it. I didn't get a lot of the accessories, but hopefully I can figure some things out tonight, and um, maybe not need all the programming software that comes with it. And um, but I'm sure there's a few accessories I'll pick up tomorrow. We'll just carry it over to George's house and. He, we'll, he can program it for yeah. us. Yeah, I thought I'd get George or Tommy to give me a little uh, hand with it tomorrow and show me some of the features. And uh, <laughs> So anyway. Yeah, I'm sure we can handle that. Well, All right. Well, i got to get back to my table, man. They're going to be walked off with the other half of it if I don't get back. So well, good so, to see you. Well, stop back by and show us what you buy with your, uh, with your loot okay. after you get finished. It's a deal. I think we hit the mother load again. This is a, a type N gold plate. It's a little heavy for the nose, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, you saw Tommy and Jimmy talking to Steve earlier. Steve was, uh, his early broadcast career began uh, working with me, and uh, he's still in broadcasting. And here's another guy here who I used to work with that's uh, still a broadcaster, Stan Carter. Hi, George. Good to see you here. Good to see you, Stan. Uh, how many years have you been coming to the Ham Fest now? Uh, I've probably been coming to the Ham Fest now about on and off 15, 16 years. Yeah, me too. You know, we used to uh, bring some stuff down here and sell uh, sort of surplus, and I see over here on the table you've brought some similar items to sell off here. Were, th were these uh, pulls out of transmitters you got? Yes, they were. One of the advantages of working in the broadcast industry, you've always got partially used tubes sitting around, and they usually go fairly well at the ham fest, so that's one of my popular items. I see you've got a tower belt over here, too. Do you think that'll fit Tommy? Uh, maybe. We let it out all the way. Okay, because he, he's my uh, a designated tower man these days. Well, him or really Wayne. I guess Wayne's the one who does most of my tower work now. What's this meter that you've got right here? It goes up to 150%. I, that's an interesting story there. That is a real antique there. That came from an RCA 50,000-watt AM broadcast transmitter that was manufactured back in the uh, mid to late 1940s. The model number, it was an RCA BTA 50F AM broadcast transmitter, and that was the main power output meter out of the transmitter when it was decommissioned and scrapped for parts. So that's what a 50 kilowatt reflectometer looks like. That would be correct. All right, 73, Stan, we'll catch up with you after a while. 73, George, thanks for stopping by. 
Tommy, this is what I'm interested in right here. What about you? Yeah, there's my tickets right there. I've got them all over. I distributed them evenly through the barrel when I tossed them in. I use that technique that we learned about in Dayton where you kind of fold your ticket and throw it in there and it sticks up better, but I see someone else has done that too. Mine are way down there at the bottom right now, but uh, Friday evening, you know, that's not a, a big time at the ham fest, but the barrel's already beginning to fill up. Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. I would have been, uh, I didn't think it'd be quite that many. Man, we run into a lot of friends out here. We actually got one to hold still long enough so we can interview him. You've seen our friend Wayne on here several times. He went to uh, Huntsville with George, and this is his brother, Vince, in 5 kqw But um, you uh, get find a lot of good stuff to buy here, Vince? I find a ton of good stuff to buy. Uh, did you buy a lot of good stuff? I bought one good stuff. What did you get? I ended up picking up a uh, Yesu VX7R secondhand. Oh, nice. The with a bunch of accessories. Yeah. You like me, you probably got a whole bunch of handy talkies too. I think last year we had you on here with, you just got a new handy talkie, right? Uh, that's right, and I still got it. Hey, there's uh, Vince's brother Wayne hanging out behind the camera over here. And, uh, come on, come on over, man. Cold front coming in right here. Yeah, you remember Wayne, he did the weather when George uh, got his new shop. It, uh, how's it been going? Pretty good, pretty good. And you? Yeah, I'm doing good, man. Did, uh, did you buy anything yet? Uh, not yet, no. Still looking. Probably going to be getting power supply and or maybe an antenna tuner. Not sure yet. Oh, tuner, yeah, that's, those are good purchases. Uh, yeah, you were looking at the little MFJ like we gave away on the show a while back, aren't you? I believe so. I believe so. A little 30-amp switching supply for less than $90. Probably not a bad deal, so. Yeah, it sounds like a good deal. I'd like to have a couple of those myself. I could... Uh, Replace my two big ones with uh, the little small ones like that to get a lot of room. They're nice. They are, and the one I've got is kind of kind of going bad on me. It's still working, but uh, it's not keeping the amperage up like it's supposed to, so it's probably about time to get a new one. Yeah, it sounds like you're about due. We well, appreciate you stopping by and talking with us. If you get any more good stuff, come by and let us know. I'll definitely do it. Thank you. It sure was good to see Jim, Steve, Stan, everybody. Yeah, it was. Old Jim, man. He just keeps on rolling, doesn't he? Yes, sir. He, uh, he had a pretty good table full of stuff to sell there. He sold it all out, too. Uh, I don't know if I even saw him uh, the next day. No, I didn't. I think he cl cleaned out. On the first Oh, thing? no, no. He, he was there Saturday for a okay. while. Okay, a little while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and Steve and Stan, I used to uh, work with both of those guys uh, back uh, over here at the radio stations. Yeah, yeah, good guys. Uh, St uh, Steve bought his new handy talkie. Yeah, and I hadn't heard from him, so I guess he got it programmed. Yeah, I kept expecting to hear him on the air, but I haven't. I haven't either. So we may have to check up on him. Maybe it's not programmed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Stan ever sold that uh, 50 kilowatt power meter he had there or not. I'm going to have to check with him on that. I'd like to have that. It looked nice right here over Poseidon. Uh -huh. Poseidon. You know, it goes to 150%. And everybody needs one of those. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Speaking of that barrel of tickets, Tommy, how did you come out? <clears throat> Pretty well empty-handed. I brought home a bunch of ticket stubs. Well, that's... And, and, and writer's cramp from filling them out. Yeah, me too. I didn't win anything either. So the old folding the ticket trick just didn't pay off for us. No, it didn't pan out. Yeah, maybe we should have been using the stamps to fill them out with. Yeah. That would have done it. <laughs> and, you know, while we were there... Uh, of course, the sign man was there, and his, his booth was right in front of ours. And some of you may have seen these. These are the I'm a fan of Ham Nation badges that uh, mm -hmm. the sign man started selling at Dayton last year. And, and they've been several ham fests selling these, and a lot of people are getting them. And our pal Arnie was there. Arnie said he's a fan of Amateur Logic, too. Yeah, so uh, Arnie had one custom design there, and I suspect the sign man would make one for anyone else who wanted one. Uh, it looks nice. I should have got one. I did pick up one of these, though. My old uh, name badge was, what, at least 20 years old, so it was time for a new one. So uh, Simon makes some good badges. Yeah, I need to see him next time get one made myself. Yeah, you should. Well, now let's uh, take a moment and have a word here from our sponsor, Gigaparts.com. The Yesu FT950. Big rig features without the big rig price. Eight band pass filters and IFDSP give you the control you would expect from a Yesu. IF shift, IF width, notch, and contour 
each have dedicated buttons grouped together on the FT950 front panel, making it easy to pick out weak stations even when they're adjacent to strong signals. Get the most out of your transmit audio by using the FT950's transmit monitor feature, which allows you to hear the output of the radio's built-in microphone equalizer. Right down to the tuning knob, made from 165 grams of turned brass, the FT950 delivers big performance at a price you can afford. Gigaparts is the largest independent amateur radio dealer in the nation. Everything you need for ham radio, including books, DVDs, antennas, rope, coax, and tuners. Gigaparts has it all and is open Monday through Saturday. Call us toll free at 866 535 4442 and our friendly staff will be happy to help you find the right products for nearly any project and budget. Online shopping made easy with real time pricing and availability, and free shipping on most orders. Go to gigaparts.com and enter to win a free radio. Have a question? Click on Live Chat for a quick answer. Low prices? Huge selection. America's favorite ham radio store is Gigaparts. Now through March 31st, 2013, you get a $150 discount off of a Yesu FT950. That is a good deal. And you know, March 16th is Ham Radio Day at Gigaparts. And to celebrate, hams can enter once per day at the gigaparts.com website for a chance to win a Yezu FT950 that will be given away on that day. They'll have representatives from all the major ham manufacturers on hand. Uh, so make your plans now to visit gigaparts.com in Huntsville, Alabama on March the 16th. You may even see some AmateurLogic.tv folks there. Yeah, I bet you will. Also through March 16th, use the promo code ALTVGIFT at checkout and you'll receive a free gift with your order from yeah. gigaparts.com. It's a good deal. We're proud to have Gigaparts on board with us here. And now let's go see what Peter has this time around. G'day everyone. It's my turn to do a bit of smoke and solder. And so this month I've decided to make the NS40 Classy Transmitter. It's quite an inexpensive little uh, kit. It's available from the Four State QRP group and cost about $30. And they send you this little bag of goodies to attach to your circuit board. And there's the circuit board. Now there are no inductors and no coils because they're actually etched onto the circuit board. What a clever idea. And with only around 14 components, it shouldn't take very long to make at all. On this side, you'll see it's actually, uh, they've got white patches, just like a QSL card. I think the idea is you're supposed to fill in the reception de details, attach a stamp, and send it through the post. Don't know whether anybody would ever actually do that, but uh, anyway, uh, cheap, inexpensive, uh, but rather clever little kit, and we're going to make that today. The first thing we're going to do is the three resistors uh, as per the assembly guide, which you'll find on the Four State QRP Group's website. Um, the colours of each resistor are clearly marked. Uh, the 1 meg is brown, black, green. The 330K, orange, orange, yellow. And the 100 ohm uh, resistor, brown, black, brown. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So let's go and solder. We've now got a hot soldering iron. Now we get into a, a bit of a discussion here about technique. Uh, purists will say that you shouldn't uh, try to melt the solder, but should in fact heat the joint up first. They're probably right, but sometimes I must admit I'm tempted to melt the solder on the uh, soldering tip itself. Of the manual here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven capacitors, each with a three digit number. So we'll pull those out and uh, we'll uh, proceed to uh, put them in place. And it doesn't look as though, uh, as with the resistors, they have to go in any particular order. So uh, let's see how we go. 
Here we go. C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, 104. 103, 471, 471, uh, 102, 751, and 103. Now we finish soldering. There don't appear to be any solder bridges, which is good. And the components look fairly firmly in place. And, you know, we've done 10 of the 14 components, so we're making pretty good time here. Next up is the choke L1, which is this cylindrically or cylindrical looking object, and it goes across here like so. Now we've got a bit of a problem here. In the course of my soldering, you'll see that I've dabbed a little bit of solder onto uh, this hole here, and that's one of the three holes where this transistor is going to go. Now this transistor is T1 I think. We'll just go back have a quick look. Uh, Q1 I should say. And it's mounted uh, here and there's a heat sink that's attached. So what I'm going to have to do is clear that hole for starters and the way I'll do it is I'll first of all put it back in the clamp here and just make sure I note where the hole is. It's that one right there. I've got this needle, and we'll see if we can heat it up and then just put a little hole through it, like so. What will that now do is come in from the other side like so as you can see it's still sealed up but a little luck I heat that up there's my needle coming through now I'm wiggling it around as I go just to make the hole bigger ouch hmm hoody bites ouch so anyway that is a bit better now we'll just again come in from this side and again see if we can make that hole a little bit bigger. Okay, now it's time for Q2 and it says that the flat face, which is flat face here, it's got to be orientated towards the top edge of the board. Now when I look at a picture, it looks to me like they mean this way, that is facing the crystal, which is right next door. So we'll put the three leads in, and it says that I've got to push these leads through about halfway. The final component is the 7.030 uh, crystal, and this can go in any way. What I'm going to do is this actually goes in, I'll just double check here. This goes right next to Q2. Make sure I get that right. It's across like so. But I'm going to leave the leads relatively long because I may want to pull this crystal out at a later stage and uh, replace it with a number of other crystals that I have. Now I'm going to mount the heatsink uh, here. A couple of things to note. They actually say you should mount the heatsink first and put the, uh, the nut through. However, I, uh, uh, I kind of preferred to solder the transistor in place first and then put this through. As long as you get the hole uh, pretty well lined up, I don't think it matters too much. Also says uh, ideally you should use heat sink grease, which I don't have any of at the moment. But in a little later in the piece, I'll, uh, I'll get some and we'll add that in. But for the time being... We'll just lock this into place. Now, very important to make sure that the heatsink isn't touching any other components, including the crystal. But uh, we won't make that too tight, just nip it up. So, here, yeah, there we go. Well, the moment of truth has arrived.
I've attached a BNC connector to the antenna terminals here. I've got plus 12 volt in ground uh, power coming in here. It's going to my uh, power supply. Uh, that I'm supplying it with 13.8 volts. And I've made up a homemade key because I don't actually own a Morse key. And uh, in the course of doing so, I uh, spilt a bit of blood, but that's the price you pay for making these segments. And, uh, well, it's all ready to go. I've got power coming in here. This needs to be connected to a resonant 40-meter antenna. Uh, I'm using my 20-meter antenna, uh, which is uh, uh, running through my antenna tuner, which I've already tuned up. And uh, for reception purposes, I've got my ICOM IC751 running without an antenna, but at such short range, uh, it should pick up anything that's transmitted. So uh, we've done lots of soldering so far. The question is, will there be smoke? Hopefully not. There's only one way to find out. Here we go. I think that was uh, correct Morse code. It's been that long since I've actually sent my own call sign, but uh, there you go. Uh, you know, I don't know wh whether that's particularly chirpy or clicky. Uh, I'll leave that to those who are more knowledgeable about uh, CW to, uh, uh, to comment. But from where I sit, uh, it seems to work quite well. And, uh, look, I think it's a great little kit. And, uh, I, you know, even if it is a little bit chirpy, uh, I, I thoroughly recommend it. Relatively inexpensive. Uh, special thanks to the Four State QRP group for putting this all together. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, put it all together in one night and you'll have a ball. Peter, that looked like a really fun project there. And I was proud to see another member of the team here pick up a soldering iron, Tommy. There you go. <laughs> so, have you made any Q cells with it yet? No, no, no. I, I, you know, it's been years since I've used my Morse, but uh, uh, I'm actually got a, another uh, uh, project in mind for it. Um, and basically, I want to actually use the Raspberry Pi to send data using that transmitter from one point to another. So, uh, I'm going to interface it at some point. Yeah, well, it looked like a really fun project and easy to build too. But I wanted to ask you about that vice you had there on your bench. What what is that vice? Who makes that? I'm not sure who the manufacturer is. Uh, I actually bought it from J Car Electronics, which is a local electronics store uh, here in Australia. Um, relatively inexpensive, uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, you know I needed something to be able to hold circuit boards when I'm operating on them. Yeah, it looked like the perfect thing. You know, I use a Panavice. It's mm -hmm. probably around fifty dollars American. So uh, mm -hmm. it's good to see that there are some other options out there. And that was certainly a nice looking one. I'm a little embarrassed, but uh, next month you guys will see what I use. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to go shopping after that. Uh, I may have to go to Harbor <laughs> Freight, huh? Are you, are you going to do a bit of soldering, uh, Tommy? Yeah, I, I uh, put something together uh, that, I, that I built previously, the Fox Hunt transmitter. Ah, okay. Well, yeah. while we were at the Ham Fest, we saw a guy there that had a neat little rig, didn't we, Tommy? Oh, he did. We, we've kind of heard about this before, but this is the first time we've seen one, and this was really portable. Yeah, I've seen them on the Internet, but uh, this is the first time I've seen it up close. Now, unfortunately, he doesn't get his name yeah. or call size. I, I did, but I swear I can't find the card it was on. Either I'm hallucinating that I wrote it down, but I know, I'm pretty sure I got it. He has a whole portable D-Star hotspot in a little plastic case. He said he had it on the back seat of his car and uh, talked on D-Star all the way to the Jackson Ham Fest. Never lost connectivity. His kit consists of a Raspberry Pi, a portable lithium-ion battery, the DVAP, of course, and he used a stubby antenna so it'll fit in the case. For connectivity, he had a MiFi. Uh, he was walking around the Ham Fest with it in his pocket. And he's using a a wireless dongle from his Raspberry Pi, and he's using the EDI Max one. Uh, said he got it from Amazon.com. I checked on that to see because I'll be ordering one of those myself here pretty soon. That was really neat, wasn't it, Tom? I'd like to have a setup like that. Yeah, I'm I'm planning on building one actually right. for myself. I've got everything except the uh, the little Wi-Fi dongle. I've and got I one mentioned, of those. 
mentioned that I was going to get one. I actually have that particular one in my Amazon.com shopping cart. I'm going to get a few more things and yeah. place the order this week. I think my... that's the same exact one that I have. Oh, okay, cool. Well, let's go back down to the ham fest and uh, talk to some more friends. Well, it's not a ham fest without stopping by and seeing our friend Mr. G from MFJ. How you been doing, Mr. G? Oh, good, Tommy. How you doing? Great oh. ham fest. Oh, yes, it sure is. You guys been busy? Oh, yeah. We were covered up this morning. Uh, about lunchtime, I think a lot of them have gone out for lunch. Yeah, it's all a pretty big crowd over here a little earlier. So um, I always like to stop by and see what you guys have new. I think you got some uh, antenna things happening, don't you? Well, we do. With you know, one of our most popular antennas, this 43-foot antenna, uh, it's self-supporting and it covers all bands, 160 meters all the way through six meters, and and all frequencies in between. Now, um, it's got a, a matching transformer at the bottom, and um, the impedance is um, uh, low enough where from uh, 40 meters up, you can use the antenna tuner that's built into your radio. Now, if you want to operate 80 meters and 160, you need a 160-meter antenna. It takes a ground some ground radios, um, but you can cover all bands, and it's a really good, efficient antenna. Um, uh, one of the, the the really nice things about it is totally self-supporting. Oh, yeah, that's great. It, uh, I could actually get by with something like that where I live. They, uh, we don't have antenna covenants, but they still kind of look at you pretty funny if you put something up pretty big, and uh, that, that would probably go over well. There is a 33-foot, very lightweight telescoping antenna. It's made of a, a carbon fiber pole, uh, and for um, 100 and, uh, Forty-nine dollars, you can cover eighty meters through six meters with an antenna tuner. And yeah, so it's it's a wire that goes on the inside of it. You just pull it up, and you can use it as a portable, lightweight, very very nice antenna. Real popular antenna. Yeah, hey, I, I didn't get to make it over to the uh, the anniversary show this time, but George uh, covered. He brought me back a piece of chicken. Oh well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you got the chicken. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we appreciate George and uh, and the whole group coming down there to see us. Yeah, I'll we'll make it next time. But uh, anyway, it's nice talking to you, Mr. G. Okay, well, it's nice talking to you, too. Okay, we're all out for a leadership training session. That'll be in rooms one and two. At one o'clock, we have the Flex SDR presentation in room three. And at two o'clock in room three, we have the interview. Well, Richard, Mr. G told us we need to come talk to you if we wanted to know what was new. Yeah, he kind of does that to me. puts me on the spot, and I'm sweaty and nasty. We've been working hard here at the Jackson Ham Fest, so it's kind of rough. Yeah, I saw you've been going at it both days, full speed here. Nice well, what, what is this you've got here? We got, uh, we got a couple of new products that are, that are fun, interesting gadgets. This particular one here is the weather station. It comes with a uh, wind, windometer, also your rain gauge. And what's neat about this is you can put in different pictures. It's a, it's a weather uh, it's a, it's a uh, weather forecaster. It gives you the icons. It gives you wind speed. It gives you the temperature, indoor and outdoor. It gives you barometer, rainfall, et cetera, et cetera. But you can go through the menu here, and you can display, like, your, your kids' pictures. Here we go. And then you can put your picture and your, and your weather map and have that going at the same time. And it's $149.95. It's another product that we carry from the lacrosse technology people that do a really good job with that. And this one right here, I've, I've heard about this before. I think Tommy has seen it. Remote Shack. Tell us about that. John Troy down in Florida, and we'll be working real closely with him at uh, Orlando, Florida. He's got a Remote Shack controller. And what this does is you can control uh, this rig, control your rig through your cell phone. Uh, I was in HRO in Atlanta uh, a couple of weeks ago, well, back in December, and uh, I was actually able to show these guys. I, I dialed up his radio station at home, and we actually went through the commands, and we were able to operate his radio in Florida, and I was in Atlanta on my cell phone inside the store. So it was really, really sharp. This is called the uh, Remote Shack. Uh, and this is the controller. It is a, an expensive product. It's not for everybody, but it is a solid product because each one of these John Troy tailors specifically to your individual radios. For instance, when you buy this kit, 
This one's clearly labeled for the IC7000. You get all the cable assembly and your ferrite chokes and all the tools you need to hook up your radio to the controller and operate it with your cell phone. One of the cool things that John does is he shows in his advertising is he's sitting on the beach drinking a Bloody Mary and he's got his uh, cell phone and he's operating his radio on the beach. So very cool stuff. We're partnering with him and we are his distributorship for, for the U.S. and overseas. And uh, it's a really sharp product. I think everybody would have a lot of fun with it. And operating through your cell phone is really neat. Yeah. Well, thanks, Richard. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, look into this a little further and... Uh, might play with one of these sometime. I think, uh, see what we, we can we can probably help you out there and let you show that on Amateur Logic sometime. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking a moment to talk with us. I know you've been busy and there's customers standing around, so there's we won't hold you. To give us money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to turn that down. Yes, sir. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. You know, it's always great to see Martin and Richard when we go to these ham fests and different events. Oh, yeah, sure is. Always fun to talk with them. And while we were there, I had a little chat with Martin, and uh, we got MFJ on board as an advertiser with Amateur Logic. Yeah, yeah I'm psyched about yeah. that. Yeah, we're proud to have them because, you know, when we decided that we we're going to take advertising on Amateur Logic to help cover the cost, we we're going to be a little selective on who we chose. And, and these were you know guys that were at the top of our list there so oh yeah they've, they've been friends of amateur logic since since we started yeah they've always sent us some nice toys to play with here as a matter of fact i've got one today and that's the mfj 998 rt remote auto tuner that'll handle 1.5 kw legal limit and it goes from 1.8 megahertz to 30 megahertz uh, the MFJ 998 RT will instantly match impedances anywhere from 12 to 1600 ohms using MFJ's exclusive IntelliTune adaptive search and instant recall algorithms with over 20,000 virtual antenna memories. When you key your transmitter, MFJ's instant recall checks to see that that frequency has been used before. If so, it instantly tunes it. If not, then the IntelliTune algorithm takes over measures the impedance real quick, and then snaps in the necessary components and fine-tunes it to give you the lowest SWR. It uses a high-efficiency L network to match coax-fed and wire antennas. The MFJ998RT has a weather-sealed ABS plastic top cabinet and a stainless steel chassis so it's not going to rust, and it's remotely powered through your coax using an included bias T so that means there's no additional wires to run. There's also an amplifier radio tuner protection circuit that protects your gear against output static and lightning surges. And check out the fine workmanship inside here. They use a surface mount machine to place all these tiny little SMT parts. And then the PC board goes through a wave solder machine to solder the through hole parts. And look at these giant cores here. They're wound by a stitch and thread machine that I showed on a uh, recent episode of Amateur Logic during my last visit there to the MFJ factory. And better yet, the firmware is filled up gradable using a serial port so you can download and upgrade your MFJ 998 RT as new features are introduced. And it's protected by MFJ's famous one year no matter what warranty. So if you've got a problem, MFJ will repair or replace your tuner no matter what, for a full year. The MFJ998 Remote Auto Tuner is only $769.95 list price, and it's available at mfjenterprises.com or at your favorite ham radio dealer. We've got one other product there from MFJ we want to talk about real quick. That's uh, sitting over here in front of you, Tommy. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. You know, MFJ keeps manufacturing Morse code products. I hear Martin Jew, K5FLU, really loves 40 meter CW. He does. Yeah. Uh, the MFJ 553 Deluxe Wood Based Telegraph Key features a Morse code straight key on a non skid, beautifully stained wood base designed by Austin Mann, KA5MAN. And uh, it is beautiful. It has uh, real weight to it, it stays uh, put on your desk. It's got rubber feet on the bottom. The cord's already wired, ready to go. The contact points are even adjustable on it. If you've been thinking about getting into CW or want a nice looking collectible straight key, check out the MFJ 553 at only $29.95.
That is a fine looking key there, and I'm going to have to have a chat with them because I think I need to buy that. I, I can't find my old key from the 70s, and I bet Peter could have used one of those this time around too. Yeah, indeed. It uh, would go nicely with my 40 meter transmitter. It would. Yeah, this, the key's nice. I'll tell you what, I'm interested in the, uh, the remote antenna tuner. Why would you need a remote tuner like that? Why wouldn't you just have your tuner in the shack? Yeah, that's what, like I do. Well, there's a good reason for that. You know, most AM broadcast stations, they run their 50-ohm transmission line from the transmitter out to the tower. And at the base of that tower, there's a matching network, which is essentially, you know, what our tuners are in ham radio. And the reason you put the matching network or the tuner right there at the base of the tower is so you can make the impedance transformation right there. Because when we have our tuner in the shack, uh, that's fine. We can adjust it and it'll match it where the radio is seeing 50 ohms and is happy. But what actually happens is now your 50 ohm transmission line is not necessarily operating at 50 ohms anymore. And there can be standing waves on the transmission line itself and bandwidth limitations and such. So when we put the tuner right there at the antenna, then we've got 50 ohms all the way from the radio through the transmission line up to where the tuner is located. So then we just match that 50 ohm transmission line right to the antenna and we've got less loss and a few, lot of you know other problems are avoided by doing that. And this looks like, you know, a nice unit that they built here because uh, it's made to stay out in the weather and you only have to run the coax. You don't have to run any more wires. So Yeah, a lot more yeah. efficient. Yeah, you do. If you've got the option, you do want your tuner right there at the antenna. And I just had somebody ask me that question in an email earlier today. Oh, well, there you go. So now, let's see. Where, where are we on the show here? I think we need to go back to the ham fest one more time, Tommy. All right. Well, I ran into my old pal here, Tom Brown. Tom? Glad to see you, George. Very nice to be here. Good to see you again, and I know you and Omega Tech are always up to something new up there, and I'm going to have to come have a tour of that factory before too much longer. I've let it go too long now, but wh what are y'all doing these days? We keep some uh, interesting magic going most of the time, and uh, this antenna right here is a pretty good example. It's a full range 1.8 to 30 megahertz HF antenna. Right now this version is 125 watts maximum power and it's targeted at commercial emergency services, disaster relief, that sort of thing, that market. It's in the process of getting into that market. When we get there, the next version will be a ham version, uh, less expensive, designed to operate, to get folks on to 160, 80, 40, in restricted neighborhoods and as small as it is it won't matter how restricted your neighborhood is it's about the size of a picnic table so is this a, a mobile and a base antenna it is as you see it sitting here it's a mobile antenna it just mounts on top of a humvee a suv i've used it on the back of my pickup truck if you add the conductive table that's four feet by eight feet it sits about three feet off the ground. If you add that, then it can be on top of a building, a hospital, uh, your deck. If you have a flat roof, you put it there, you can put it on the ground. We have one at our lab on rollers that we just roll out in the parking lot to operate on. And we've been very pleased with how well it works in a variety of environments. So how would you compare it to say maybe a, a dipole or, or you know, a more standard antenna? It is, I'm going to say anybody you could normally work on a dipole, you should be able to work on this antenna, given the average propagation. In um, every test we've run, we've operated from EOC headquarters in other states, hospitals, um, various locations that we've conducted tests. We have not, we have not, not been able to make contact on this antenna when we were able to make any contact on a conventional dipole. Uh, we don't have a full HF test range to do a tighten it down, better way to say that, we can't 
give you one dB difference, two dB difference, or something like that. As close as we can tell, we're just as functional. So bottom line is it works. Bottom line is it works. It's, it's, and I've had to continue to prove that to myself because conventional wisdom would say it shouldn't. We've gone to great lengths to eliminate possible stray effects. We operate on battery. We operate with only four or five feet of transmission line, so it's not transmission line, it's not power line, it's not tower. We've tried to cut off all of the mitigating circumstances that might give us false results, and just the antenna really works like we think it does. So what's the secret? I mean, what makes this work? This is not nearly long enough for 160 meters. It's not as big as it needs to be, isn't it? It's what it looks like. We are actually in the process of putting together a, what you might call a white paper on the physics behind it. That's something that we have been refining over the last six months to a year using advanced computer modeling software as well as a lot of detailed field tests, measurements. Um, it's a different concept and we don't, have it, we don't have it nailed down and fully described enough yet to publish, but that's coming. It is, it's not the same physics that you'd see as far as a dipole or a whip or the things that we're used to seeing. It's not like a screwdriver antenna, for instance. Uh, it is something different, and I can't wait till we can put the technical description out. I think folks will be real interested in it. And so, so this is broadband. Is there tuning required to change bands or what? This compartment encloses an automatic tuning unit, and basically we're operating over one cable now. Uh, when you hook your transceiver up, it goes into a little interface box that sits next to the transceiver. The RF cable is the only thing that goes to the antenna. The automatic tuning unit in this enclosure interprets what comes from the interface and it automatically tunes you up within, I think about 2.8 seconds is our maximum tune time right now. So I, I see it's got the insulator here in the middle. Is this sort of like split like a dipole? or It's the way it would look. It literally looks like a large surface area fat dipole but that, that's not at all how it behaves. But this is part of the structure. Uh, it's fed across this, and the conductive table is connected to the feed system. There is high voltage across this insulator. Uh, that's one reason this is a 125-watt model. We have made experimental models at higher power, and part of the task we have there is controlling the voltage, which we've been successful with, but it results in a more expensive antenna at this time. That's, we will have higher power models coming in the future, though. And, and I know you don't know this yet, but any ballpark range of, of what something might, like this might go for when it's released to amateur radio? You know, I don't know yet because it, it, we'll, we'll offer two versions to hams. We'll offer an auto-tuned version that is, it, is as inexpensive as we can make it because we want folks to be able to afford it. It won't be quite the emergency response class just to save some money. We also plan to offer manual tune versions to the ham market and those will be the real affordable ones. You take a fellow like me, I can put up a small antenna for the higher bands or use a loop, but this is ultimately what will get me on 160 and 80 where I want to be in my neighborhood. And so we'll probably offer a model with fixed tuners built in that will get a ham on 160, 80 or 160, 80 and 40 if that's what he wants and wants to save the money. So we'll have options there. Well, that's I good. I wish I had a better guess at a price, but we don't have, we don't have that um, developed quite far enough to really know yet. And, and this was your entry product here, wasn't it? That's it. That's, and our, you, that's our two meter antenna. You've changed that a little since the last time I saw it. We have. We, we needed to make it flexible, so we've added a, a flexible portion at the bottom, flexible portion at the top. It's only rigid right in the middle, but we still get oh, 2 to 4 dB of improvement over most OEM antennas. Sure helps me because I can work the main repeater down the 7.6 from my home with our antenna, and I can't with the OEM Yesu antenna. Yeah, those are neat. You know, I've got one, and I've, I've been real impressed at, at just what it does. I mean, it's no taller than the antenna that came with my handy talkie, but, boy, it sure makes a difference. You've had some good results. That's what we had talked about. Well, I'm glad because that's what we want. 
Well, Tom, I appreciate you talking with us, and I am going to get up there and uh, and take a look one day. Come see us, George. We'll give you the full behind-the-scenes tour. All right, 7-3. Hey, 73. Thanks, George. Yeah, that that is the oddest-looking antenna to me. It, it's, it really fascinates me, though. Yeah, you know, it looks kind of cool, too. Uh-huh, it you does. Know, I, I'd like to have that on the back of my expedition out there. Yeah, you know the... The uh, Megatech guys, they're just on the cutting edge with their antenna uh, designs. They are. You know, I'm not sure what all they do up there. I'm going to have to go take a look. But every product that they make is a little bit different. You know, their handy talky antennas are, are specially designed with a, a unique circuit in them. And so is this mm -hmm. antenna. So they're into, you know, uh, new technologies and, and doing things in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Cool stuff. So... I think we need to go see what Emil is up to. Sorry I missed the uh, ham fest, guys. Uh, had another hobby that took over. Yeah, uh, speaking of that, you know, it's really not that dangerous up here if you're used to New Orleans. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with that. I was participating in a uh, tournament down here, and uh, it paid off, so it, uh, that worked out for me. Yeah, that's some nice-looking bling you got. Yeah, I got my Mardi Gras bling and my uh, Taekwondo bling so we know how you got the taekwondo bling how did you get the mardi gras bling oh, wait 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 is, i don't yeah, know this is a family show right? oh okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't do that on the air yeah speaking of mardi gras are you going this year um yeah the kids and i and uh, family do have plans we, we just went to a parade last night here in slidell and the rest of it starts uh into next week all the way to tuesday it gets crazy in the city so yeah. we have the plans for that well oh, that's I think I went to Mardi Gras one time. You don't remember? Yeah. <laughs> and you survived. <laughs> yeah. What about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl, or were you at home uh, operating that night? Yeah, you know, I, I totally missed the Super Bowl. In fact, I, I worked downtown, and it got crazy uh, with all the media and uh, stuff they build down there. But So I stayed home, and, and, I, and I got to operate a little bit of uh, on the radio. And there was one point on 80 meters when I was tuning my amplifier, and... Oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, real, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, nobody watching there. Uh, please don't, don't turn an email to the officials. We need them back here next month. Could have been me. <laughs> well, what are you doing this month, Emil? Um, the, my segment this month is on the. Uh, ham radio deluxe software um I, I'll, I'll do a lot of digital work so i use the digital master but uh, this segment is more on the uh, network capabilities and automation of actually performing qso's with that software cool hello and welcome to another episode of cheap old man minutes you just have to love a hobby where the first thing you usually have to do in order to make something work is to take it apart and physically wire it as in this one, as in this interface's case, I had to wire uh, the inputs and outputs uh, physically for my uh, Yesu. After configuring the interface, then you can hook it up to the appropriate ports on the back of your rig and make sure it's configured properly. And plug it in on the computer end in the USB ports. I find this particular suite of applications nice because you can control the rig, automatically log contacts via EQSL, Logbook of the World, and several others and perform lookups and also decode a pretty good swath of digital modes that are available and even even identification via the RSID tags is uh, included in this particular suite but the combination of the three working together is a pretty nice setup which is why I chose to uh, review with this. Another nice feature of this software is its integration with QRZ XML lookup service. So with a subscription to QRZ you can easily click on the QSOs in progress and perform lookups so that the information for your logs are automatically populated via QRZ's, uh, QRZ's database, which I find is a nice feature. Along with the QRZ subscription feature, the logbook software also integrates with EQSL 
Logbook.cc and Logbook of the World in others. Uh, and also you can export it to the standard formats, the ADIF and uh, others for that matter. Um, there's also a nice feature which shows you uh, the recent sunspot activity, uh, solar cycle progression charts, and uh, some audio monitoring tools you can use to record, and DX cluster support. So there's uh, quite a bit of thought put into this software and how it all works together and can also be distributed amongst your uh, home network computers to, um, to really leverage or automate some of the tasks for uh, recording and logging. Good stuff. Man, Ham Radio Deluxe is great software. There's yeah. some, some of everything in that. It's, it's phenomenal that they still have that free version out. They support it. And uh, being a cheap old man and having a few minutes with that is uh, wonderful. It's, it's worth talking about in this hobby. Yeah, you know, I've used it for years myself. You've used it too, haven't you, Tony? Yeah, I actually did a review on the show a long time back. On yeah, well. it, it's a great piece of software. I do really like the way that you were showing the how it all integrates together. And with the automation, it saves you so much time and just makes things so much easier. It, it'll spool you rotten if you got an internet connection and you integrate it with that QRZ uh, log uh, function lookup. So it'll spool you rotten. Yeah, I used to use that a lot uh, on the DX spot so that I could just go through there and uh, double click on a DX spot and tune my radio right to it. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, like that's shooting great. fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to be doing next month? Um, I'm thinking next month I'm going to continue along the uh, digital realm, uh, exploring some of the uh, newer uh, slow scan television modes. There's a new digital slow scan television mode with the EasyPal software mm -hmm. and also the analog version built into the Ham Radio Deluxe. So that's probably what I'll be talking about next time. Well, give me a shot one night and we'll get on HF and try some of that out. Will do. All right, 73 email and happy Mardi Gras. 73 guys. Yeah, 73 to you, man. And now let's have a message here from one of our sponsors, ICOM. You know, if you're looking for a radio and you can't decide what you need, do you want a HF, a 6 meter, uh, 2 meters, or 70 centimeters? Well, the sky's no limit with the ICOM IC9100, the all-around transceiver. What sets the IC9100 apart from other radios? The 9100 contains years of advanced ICOM technology and a compact all-in-one HF 6 meter VHF UHF transceiver. The radio covers most ham bands and modes and provides a wide variety of operating styles. Whether you're working DX, RIDI, D-Star, Satellite, or even Moon Bounce, ICOM's years of technological experience is working right along with you. The 9100 has independent dual receivers. It's got a built-in RIDI demodulator and decoder. There's plenty of advanced CW capabilities. And much like the technology in ICOM's higher-end transceivers, there's a dual conversion super heterodyne system and an image rejection mixer in the IC9100. It's got a built-in antenna tuner for HF and 6 meters, IF DSP controlled digital features, a USB connector for audio and data, plus remote control capabilities, 32-bit floating point DSP and 24-bit A to D converters for superior audio and receiver performance, ICOM's great AGC loop management, digital IF filters, twin pass band tuning and IF shift, and so much more. If you want to get into D-Star, no problem. Just add the UT-121 for D-Star DV mode, digital voice, and low speed data communications. How about 1.2 gigs? The optional UX9100 band unit gets you on the 1200 MHz band immediately. Go to ICOM America today and learn more about the IC9100 multi-band, multi-mode, all-around transceiver, as well as all the other great ICOM amateur radio products. That's ICOMAmerica.com. Yeah, you know, ICOM makes great products, man. I've got three ICOM radios now. You do. You've uh, really bought in recently, haven't you? Yeah, I'm having a ball with them. It's great stuff. And what, what all have you got? I've got an IC92 AD and handy that's, talkie, that's dual a, band, dual watch. I bought the ID31 handy talkie, and I've got the IC2820 mobile rig uh, with D-Star in it. I want a, 
I want one of those. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It is awesome. And I that, love that thing. That new 51 is pretty nice, too. If I could have both of those right there, then I think I'd be fixed up on radios until at least something else new came out. Yeah, I don't have a 51 <laughs> yet, but, yet, but I will. <laughs> Tommy, have you got an email over there? Man, I, I do have an email. You know, I thought we almost forgot about emails today, but here they are. Yep. Okay. We can't go without that. I got one from Dick, W4DAC. He says he enjoyed the segment on the tape measure Yagi antenna. He's planned to present the video at his upcoming radio club meetings. They're getting interested in doing fox hunts. Um, anyway, their, uh, their club is the Port St. Lucie Amateur Radio Association in that's almost a tongue twister, man. In Port St. Lucie, Florida. The question he has is he briefly skipped over the tuning loop at the feed point. Can you give some detail on the measurements of where to find or where to find the details of the loop? Keep up the good work on bringing ham radio to more viewers. And I actually wanted to cover more of that, uh, but you can only get so much yeah. in 10 minutes. So the uh, it was just a 5-inch piece of uh, Romax wire I used, 14-gauge wire. Exactly five inches. So does that mean is that you go out five inches, then you turn and you come back five inches? I, no, I cut five inches and folded oh, and it then in folded half. It. Okay, I got you. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, it's just long enough to cancel out the capacitive reactance, according to the author of the plans, okay. and it, it worked perfect. Yeah, you measure that with an antenna analyzer mm -hmm. too, didn't you? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was great, and uh, I did tweak my SWR a little bit by just uh, loosening the hose clamps and mm -hmm. sliding the radials out just a little bit to, to lengthen them just a hair and I dropped it from uh, I think 1.4 to 1 1.2 did yeah. you know but anyway you know I, I wanted you to build a, uh, a 70 centimeter version of that but you couldn't find a metric tape could you no I couldn't <laughs> and uh, I'm still I've still got the two-thirds of the other tape measure on eBay by the way okay nobody's taking no up takers on that yet <laughs> well Peter have you got an email down there <laughs> Yes, I've got an email here from J Jose, uh, KE4SND, and uh, yeah, he saw my segment about the quarterway vertical that he's going to be building his own, uh, but using uh, radials rather than a metal roof. And he asked me, um, was it my own design? Um, much as I would like to claim credit for the design of the quarterway vertical, uh, no, it's a, a pretty stock standard uh, and well-known um, design. Uh, and uh, look, uh, if if you're interested in that or other designs, I can recommend the ARRL uh, handbook or antenna handbook, uh, which is uh, you know a, a great book for uh, learning about uh, the most basic and some more complicated antenna designs. Okay, yeah, that that is a good resource. Mm -hmm. And Peter, I've got one here from one of your fellow countrymen, Sam VK3HBU. Do you know Sam? Uh, no, it's HBU. No, it'd be in in Victoria or Melbourne though. So, uh, uh, so he's uh, obviously a local. Yeah, and he's uh, big into computer programming too. You know, we've uh, talked several times about the Raspberry Pi, and I was trying to get it to work on Echo Link. Well, Sam's kind of thrown his hat in the ring there to try to help out with it, and he's done some tests, and he says it seems that it's the Linux kernel module that's failing. You know, we had problems mm -hmm. where the audio would work for, you know, a few hours, and then it would mm -hmm. just quit. So apparently, it's the Linux current kernel module uh, for the Raspberry Pi, and uh, he doesn't know of anyone uh, rebuilding it yet. So he says he's built a kernel for his own Linux platform that supports USB sound devices instead of uh, the building of drivers as modules as it seems to be rock solid doing it this way. And he says this opens up an issue to solve if it's a kernel that's tainted or is it the module system. And he says on the default Raspberry Pi OS, it's the uh, interrupt system built into the Pi that just disables things after a while. And he's going to try rebuilding it from scratch at step by step and um, see if he can find the bug. Actually, I, I think he's just going to rebuild a distro, he's saying here, uh, from scratch, dedicated to ham radio for the Raspberry Pi. Cool. That will be cool. That is cool. a great idea. <clears throat> yeah. And he's trying to get a stable base going and uh, hopes to improve the fill and reduce the overhead and improve overall stability. And he says, I think a source-based version should fix a lot of the bugs. So that's what he's going to be doing over the next few weeks is 
building a distro from scratch. So Sam, thanks a lot for that. There's going to be a lot of folks really looking forward to that. Yeah, I wonder how long it'll take to compile that kernel. I, I've done some of that in the past on, really? on regular desktop Linux mm -hmm. systems. Uh, it's not that hard to compile it. You just have to know all the modules you want to add. Yeah. Well, apparently he's uh, uh, fluent in, uh, mm -hmm. I think, like 30 programming languages. So Yeah, yeah, I he remember emailing like, with him. He's a sharp yeah, guy. He sounds like the guy to, to take on this project. So we're all rooting for you, Sam. Yeah, we have all the faith in you, Sam. Yeah, we've heard that. Uh, no pressure. So, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard that some other folks have got an IRLP working on the Raspberry Pi, and you know you can link um, IRLP in with Echolink using an extra module. But with IRLP, you got to have that special board just for IRLP, and I'm really trying to avoid that since all I really want to do here is Echolink. So uh, hopefully Sam will get us a solution going here before long, and. Uh, We'll get on Echo Link sooner or later on that, that little bitty computer. Determined. Yep. Well, Peter, have you got any final words or thoughts down there for us? Um, yes. Uh, oh, it's Chinese New Year. So, um, happy Chinese New Year and welcome to the Year of the Snake. Year of the Snake. My wife's not going to be happy about that. <laughs> she doesn't like snakes? No. Okay. Not at all. Well, well, I'm a snake, so um, it's it's my year, which is why I'm looking forward to it. Well, this explains a lot, doesn't it, Tom? Yeah. The only the only year she'd hate worse than that would be the year of the spider. The year of the spider. Yeah, yeah that wouldn't be a good one either. <laughs> well, we hope you've enjoyed episode 50 of Amateur Logic as much as we've enjoyed it bringing it to you. And don't forget about Gigaparts Day. When is that again, Tommy? That is uh, March the 16th on Saturday. Yeah, it's actually Gigaparts Ham Radio Day. And we're planning on being there and uh, meeting some of you. And a lot of manufacturer representatives there. So if you're interested in some particular products, you can probably meet somebody from the factory there who can fill you in all about it. And, you know, just come on and meet uh, some different ham radio people and, and get to know them and get to know Gigaparts, too, because they got a great store there. And we're really looking forward to to going over there next month yeah maybe we can make a party out of the trip over and uh i'm not sure about the travel arrangements yet but uh check on the facebook group and twitter and uh, maybe we can uh some be on hf or maybe d star on the way over oh, and some things great. like that yeah and uh, anyway looking forward to meeting some of you guys face to face yeah all right we look forward to seeing you all again next month not sure what i'm doing yet but uh, it will be something I can guarantee you that. Most definitely. And I'll probably do the same thing. Something. Yeah, something. Okay. Peter? Okay, 73s, everybody. All right, 73. 73. See you next month. Tommy, we finally made it. Redneck Ham Nirvana. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Give me hell. Having kung fu lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was in the <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, let's I do that have again. I said that Peter. any better myself. Uh, now what was my segment about? I've completely forgotten. You don't remember. A little you, smoke and solder? Sorry? That didn't <laughs> that didn't do it. Huh? You built a. Uh, I've completely forgotten. Oh, sorry. Now I remember. <laughs> <laughs>